The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If you're covered by Social Security you will certainly be interested in a plan for turning your Social Security into full security. The Equitable Life Assurance Society will be glad to show you how simple that can be. Interested? Then please listen carefully in about 12 minutes to this important message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file... Subversive Activities. Its title, The Un-American Patriot. A famous Greek philosopher once wrote that words are but the shadow of actions. Consider then these words. They are written by Lenin, one of the founders of communism. He said, and I quote, The strictest loyalty to the ideas of communism must be combined with the ability to make all practical compromises, to maneuver, to do anything so as to accelerate the coming to power of a communist world. In all countries, even the freest, the time has fully matured when it is absolutely necessary for every communist systematically to combine legal with illegal work, legal with illegal organization, It is necessary for all communists to form illegal movements. End quotes. Those words should tell you what you probably already suspect. The Communist Party stands for the destruction of our American form of government. It stands for the destruction of democracy. It works toward one goal and one goal only. A Soviet of the United States. Tonight's file opens during June of 1948 on the campus of an Eastern College. The football squad is running through spring football practice. It is evening and the practice is being held under lights. Along the sidelines are a few spectators. Among them is FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor. He turns as one of the players approaches. Mr. Taylor? Oh, hello, Tim. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. Oh, it's all right. How's your dad? Oh, fine. He's out of town on a trip. That's why I called you. I had to talk to somebody. What's the matter, Ted? You in a jam? Oh, no, no. But, uh, but you know a man named Jonathan Van Buren? No, I don't think so. Well, I heard him make a speech today. Here at school? Yeah, at a hall, just off the campus. Yeah. All the students were invited. We were supposed to get inside dope on the draft, so quite a mob showed up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here you go. What was the speech about, Ted? Oh, well, I, I hate these guys who go around calling everybody they don't agree with a communist, but he sure sounded like one. In what way? Oh, he popped off about how we should destroy our stockpile of atomic bombs, how Russia is our best friend, and yeah, a lot of that kind of stuff. And did the audience buy Mr. Van Buren's violence? Well, none of us want to be drafted, and if a guy gets up and says it's wrong to take us into the army, it sounds good. Who is this Van Buren? Well, he was introduced as an expert on foreign affairs. Uh, Where's he from? I heard him tell somebody he was at the Royal Hotel. I'm not sure if he lives there all the time or just now while he's in town. Yeah. When will you be through practice? In a little while. Okay, I'll wait around, Ted. We'll pay Mr. Van Buren a visit. Come in, boy. Oh, I thought it was room service. Sorry. You Mr. Van Buren? Yes. My name is Jim Taylor, Mr. Taylor. Van Buren. This is uh, Ted Brewster. Mr. Brewster. Mr. Van Buren. I hope you don't mind our dropping in this way, but Ted here was telling me about your speech this afternoon, and I was very impressed. Well, thank you. Thank you. 
Please sit down. Uh, uh, pardon me, I've got to finish packing. Oh, of uh, course. Uh, I'm sorry the whiskey isn't here yet. I'd offer you a drink. Uh, we just finished dinner anyway. Ted says your speech was, well, very stirring. Well, of logic. Thank you, thank you. Uh, these lease locks never work when you're in a hurry. Uh, ah, there it is. Mr. Van Buren, I'll get right to the point. A group of us missed your speech today, and we'd like you to address our club. Well, I'd be delighted to, but uh, I've got a very full calendar. Well, could you make it next month? Yes, yes. I'll have some free time in July. Uh, let's see. Last week. Mm -hmm. Well, there's only one unpleasant note. We can't afford a speaker's fee. Ah, oh, don't give it another thought. I'll contribute my services greatest. I'll be glad to. Well, thank you very much. Well, then, suppose we make it definite for the uh, last week in July. Say, uh... 27th? It'll be fine, fine. Well, we send out a small newsletter before each meeting, Mr. Van Buren, mm -hmm. with some biographical data on the speaker. Could you tell us a little about yourself? Well, let's see. Uh, I've lived in every part of the world. Oh, Russia, too? Mm hmm Spent an entire year there, right after the war. Must have been interesting. Very. Uh, maybe we'd better not mention that in your notes, though, uh... Enough people think I'm a Russian apologist now, and that's uh, unpopular these days. Well, Mr. Van Buren, could we get a little more biographical material? Well, I'm an American. Put that down. My family's been here since the Revolution. <laughs> Ours, not the Russians. Hey, come, come in. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had guests. I'll come back later. No, please, we're leaving now. Oh, must you? Well, yeah, we've got some studying to do. And thanks for accepting our invitation, Mr. Van Buren. Oh, you're very welcome. Good night. Good night, sir. See you next month. I, I hope I'm not breaking in. No, no, not at all. We're really about to leave. Well, uh, good night again. Good night, sir. What do you think, Mr. Tanner? It's worth looking into. You're going to investigate him? Well, that's not up to me, Ted. I'm going back to the office, though, and write a report on Van Buren. This late? Yeah. I want my boss to see it first thing tomorrow morning. At the local FBI field office, Supervisor Williams on the subversive activities desk, read Agent Taylor's report and sent a teletype to FBI headquarters in Washington. There, the information was processed and a full investigation ordered. FBI files in Washington were searched and an answer sent to the original teletype. Supervisor Williams routed it to Agent Taylor's desk and at the same time assigned Agent Mike Dawson to work with Taylor. Jim, I understand you've got the dope on this new subversive activities case. What little there is, Mike. Somebody named Jonathan Van Buren made a speech to some students at that school Larry Brewster's boy goes to. Oh? And the speech followed the party line from beginning to end. Have you interviewed Van Buren? Monday night at his hotel... I was supposed to be a student, and he agreed to repeat the speech for some of us who missed it. Told us he spent a year in Russia after the war, and according to a teletype from Washington, he did. He omitted, however, that he was there as a guest of the Russian government. Convenient memory. Yeah. Uh, since he came back to the United States, he's been lecturing and writing on foreign policy. With the Russians footing the bill? Well, if they are, Mike, it's off the record. He's not registered with the government as a Russian agent, but the other night, as Ted and I were leaving his room... He had a very interesting visitor. Oh, who? Gregory Matagorda. Well. Yeah, and from what I hear, Matagorda has been moved into the number one spot at party headquarters. Any idea why he was there? No. What else have you got? Well, did you ever hear of a pocket magazine called World Diary? I'm sure. Well, I picked up the latest copy this morning. Here. Take a look at that cover. Yeah, thanks. Russia is Our Grateful Friend by Jonathan Van Buren. Yeah, wait till you read it. But Jim, World Diary never followed the party line. Well, they do now. I called their office this morning, and they've got a new owner. Van Buren? Yeah. So far, he's put up half the money. But he's already taken over. Well, enough so that Arthur Grayson isn't the editor anymore. Grayson's a good man. Well, he sounded like it. Oh, you've already spoken to him? On the phone. I've got an appointment to see him in half an hour. Then, Mr. Grayson, when you wouldn't change your editorial, what happened? Mr. Van Buren changed it for me. How? He took a new one out of his pocket. I guess he'd anticipated my refusal. Well, you were still the editor, though. Only for about another five minutes, maybe less. Oh, he fired you? Officially, no. Uh, you see, if he fired me, I would have gotten severance pay. Oh, I see. Well, we had a big row. I accused him of being a Russian propagandist. 
He handed me my resignation all typed up. I was so mad I grabbed it and signed. Yeah, well... Now, aside from the editorial, did you have any reason to believe that Van Buren was a Russian propagandist? Plenty. Like what? Our messenger boy told me that during the two weeks or so before I quit, Van Buren sent him on a number of errands to party headquarters here. Oh? The messenger delivered a sealed envelope from Van Buren and brought back another. Any idea what was in the ones he sent? No. How about the envelopes brought back here? Did the boy see what was in them? Cash. Now there was evidence. But Jonathan Van Buren might still find loopholes through which to escape if an arrest under the Federal Registration Act had been made. Your FBI's job was to plug those loopholes. Van Buren was put under 24-hour-a-day surveillance. On every trip, he was met at the airport and escorted during his stay. A file was slowly being built. But no real new evidence was gathered until July 4th. On that day, Special Agents Taylor and Dawson followed Van Buren to a local outdoor amphitheater where a visiting speaker was to read Lincoln's Gettysburg Address as part of the general patriotic program. Plenty of empty seats down further, Jim. Wonder why he's sitting that far back. Could be he's meeting somebody. Maybe. Mike, he doesn't know you. Why don't you turn on your portable transmitter and go up there, huh? Okay. If you sit in back of him, you should be able to catch everything he says. Yeah, where are you going? I'll stay here. I don't want him to spot me. I'll keep in touch with you, though, until you sit down. Testing, Mike. I'm testing. Am I coming in? Yes, Jim. Good. You were right about Van Buren having a date. Matagord is heading across the row he's in. Well, that ought to be interesting. I'll keep this open so you can listen. I'm near my seat. Hello, Van Buren. Welcome. Well, how are you today? Oh, patriotic. <laughs> Did you bring the money? Yes, it's inside this book. How much? Balance you owe for the magazine. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Well, I'd better go back to my own seat. Go ahead, I'm leaving. Four score Bye, Van. Bye, Gregory. Ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. Conceived Jim, liberty. did you hear that? Yeah, Mike. Let's advise the boss of these developments. In just a few minutes... We'll bring you the conclusion to tonight's case from the official files of the FBI. But first, I want you to meet Mr. and Mrs. Jackson Hill. Mr. Hill, you told me that you were interested in finding out how much it might cost to provide full security for your wife and children if something should happen to you. That's right, Mr. Keating. You do have Social Security. Well, yes, I do, but it'd only be about $105 a month. Well, that certainly isn't enough. Well, that's at least a good start. How much more would you need? We don't know. That's the problem. And that's the reason, Mr. Keating, we got so interested in the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers you talk about each week. All right. Let's look at the chart. It's Equitable's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers, especially prepared by the Equitable Life Assurance Society to help parents figure out exactly what income would be needed to keep the family together until the youngest child is at least through high school. Look how these easy-to-understand pictures guide you every step of the way. Every major item of living is included. You fill out the chart yourselves, and the answer you get is trustworthy and reliable. Why, Jack, even I can understand that. Yes, Mrs. Hill, and only five minutes with the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart will show you exactly how much money you would need. Well, how about that, Marge? We really could use one of these charts. How much does it cost, Mr. Keating? Not a cent. Your equitable representative will be glad to give you a copy. Then, after you've filled it in, he'll help you work out a plan that will turn your Social Security into full security. That's wonderful, but uh, isn't it expensive? You'd be surprised how little it may cost. You've already got a good head start with your Social Security, so that perhaps all you may need is a small additional amount of insurance. Friends, why not find out for yourself how easy it may be to turn your Social Security into full security? 
Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative and ask him for your free copy of the Equitable Fact-Finding Chart for Fathers and Mothers. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Un-American Patriot. There are still some who regard the Communist Party in America as being just another unpopular political organization. To any who might be listening, we bring the words of an expert witness, a man who only a few weeks ago fled from one of the satellite nations. One night, he told an editor of the Saturday Evening Post, ten of us were loaded into a truck and whisked off to jail. They tossed me into a brilliantly lit cell and left me there for a month. Then they questioned me, day and night. Sometimes I had to kneel before my interrogator for five hours. I was beaten and kicked by a squad of four. Between sessions, they kept me standing in a dark disciplinary cell. After two weeks, they returned me to what they called re-education. Apparently, I wasn't right, but they assured me the cycle would be repeated every couple of months. They also told me that the last of us would crack before they finished. The man who spoke those words did not dare speak them until he was out of his own country. Five years ago, he would have left if anyone had told him his nation would be taken over by the communists. But it happened there. And even more to the point, unless we in the United States maintain a constant vigilance, it can happen here. Tonight's FBI file continues two weeks later. It is Wednesday, July 21st, and there is panic in the Communist Party. Acting upon evidence supplied by the Department of Justice, a federal grand jury in New York returned indictments the day before against William Z. Foster, chairman of the Communist Party, and 11 other leading communists. They were charged with violating the Smith Act and conspiring to overthrow the government of the United States by force. And at local party headquarters, Gregory Matagorda, is doing what communist higher-ups throughout the nation have been instructed to do when Jonathan Van Buren enters his office. Well, well, well. Lighting a fire with papers? I'm getting matches. These are records that have to be burned, Van. Oh. The party's going underground and you're going with us. For how much? What do you mean? Well, I know a great deal about you and the rest of the party here and all over the country. Well? Well... Suppose I went to the FBI and told them everything. I could say my real purpose in working with you is to collect information. You wouldn't dare. I not only would, but I will. Unless my uh, salary is doubled. <laughs> I'm not authorized to do that. I want a yes or no answer. I still don't relish the idea of going to jail, but of course, if I'm going to take that chance, you'll have to pay me for it. Do I get it? All right, Van, we'll meet your terms. Taylor to Dawson. Yes, Jim. Where are you? Parked, almost in front of party headquarters. Van Buren's been inside for about uh, 20 minutes. Agent Hoffman is coming over to relieve you. But I just came on. Well, the boss wants us to work on a new angle. I've got a list of ex-employees of party headquarters. We're to interview all of them. Oh, what for? Maybe one of them can give us definite proof on Van Buren. There are uh, 15 names on the list. Jim, Van Buren just came out. He's walking to a cab in front of me. He's taking it. Call in when you hit your next stop. Hoffman can relieve you there, and we'll get started on those interviews. One of the foundations of every investigation is interviewing. In this case, 11 ex-employees of Communist Party headquarters were checked, but none of them knew Van Buren. Then came number 12, Miss Helen Schleicher, 
The boarding house where she lived was visited. She'd moved. Moved the night before. Moved in what her landlady described as terror. Why can anything come in on Helen Schleicher? No, Jim. Well, she's important. I found out she was Matagorda's private secretary. He called her the other night. That's when she packed and ran. Oh? He went to see her and was very upset when he found out that she'd moved. Now, what do you got there? Oh, this is a copy of the speech Van Buren made in Chicago last night. Oh? Uh-huh. It's the same right through. I'll get it, Mike. Yeah. Taylor speaking. Hello? Hello? FBI? Yes, that's right. Who's this? My name is Helen Schleicher. Where are you? In a movie. Where? On Madison Street. It's called the Cameo. Cameo. And you stay where you are. All right. Is the place crowded? No. Well, then sit in the back row on the right-hand side of the theater. I'm wearing a blue dress. Fine. We'll be down as soon as we can. Miss Schleicher? Yes? I'm a special agent Taylor. Another agent is waiting outside in a car. Would you mind coming with us? Of course not. Where have you been since you moved? Living with a friend. Why? Yeah, we've looked all over the city for you. Now go ahead, Miss Schleicher. Thank you. Do you know about Matagorda calling me? No. Well, he did. Right after you moved. Were you at the boarding house? Yes, but we missed you by a full day. Here's the car right here. <laughs> Miss Schleicher, this is Agent Dawson. Hello, Miss Schleicher. You get in the back, please. Thank you. Here you are. <sighs> I feel better now. Did you think you were in danger? Oh, I don't know, but well, I've seen what happens to people who know things when they try to leave the party. Have you? The day I quit working at headquarters. I took my job there because I thought they were trying to help people fight for peace. I found out they're liars. That's why I quit. I'm a Russian, but first I'm an American. In your work at party headquarters, did you run across a man named Jonathan Van Buren? Of course, he works for the party. Are you sure? Positive. We're trying to find proof of that. Well, I'm telling you. We need more. Is there anything in writing? Well, lists of paid communist agents. I used to type them myself. Mr. Van Buren's name was on them. Well, those files have probably been destroyed. About that, I don't know, but... Wait, I have carbon papers. Carbon copies? No, the carbon papers I used when I made the lists. We used carbons only once, and then I was allowed to take them home for my own work. Oh, and where are they? In my trunk at the Broadway warehouse. Mike, head for that warehouse. Miss Schleicher, are these all the carbons? I think so, but I'll look again. Jim, I'm afraid all we did was come close again. Ah, could be, Mike. Wait, wait, there are more carbons in this folder. Oh, good. Let's see, there's a letter to the embassy. This was a publicity statement. Personal letter. Here, a list of paid agents. Oh, fine, let's see. And then there's Van Buren's name. Yeah, sure is. Yeah. Well, now, Miss Schleicher, we'll have to prove this was typed on a machine at the party headquarters. Well, I typed it myself. Yes, I know, but if this were introduced as evidence against Van Buren, he might claim that we typed the list ourselves and just put his name on it. Well, I don't know where the typewriter is now. Isn't it at party headquarters? No, they bought new machines about two months ago. No, and what happened to the old ones? Mm, well, they were sold to a second-hand typewriter store on 3rd Avenue, hmm. Blake's. Jim, they'd be closed this time of night. Yeah. Well, let's take Miss Schleicher home and go over there first thing in the morning. Now there began a search for the missing typewriter. A search that started the following morning when Agent Taylor made his report. Mike, that second-hand store went out of business. The former owner was located. He said he sold his stock to other men in the same business. Other men spread through the entire city. Jim, the typewriter was bought by the Acme Typewriter Company. Records at the Acme Company were gone over and the missing typewriter located. Samples were written on it, then sent to the FBI Crime Laboratory in Washington. Mike, this wire just came in from the lab. What do they say? That's the same typewriter. Oh, hello.
Hello there, Mr. Brewster. Hello, Mr. Van Buren. And Mr. Um... Taylor. Oh, of course. Yeah, forgive me. I've been meaning to get in touch with you two. About our date? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm afraid I won't be able to make that speech. Uh, well, you may not be making any speeches for a while. <laughs> but, uh, what do you mean, I don't... Uh... Miss Schleicher. Yes? This the man? Yes. Well, who's she? You ought to know. She was the private secretary of a friend of yours, Gregory Matagorda, at party headquarters. What's the meaning of all this? I Mr. Don't... Taylor is a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. I, I don't understand. This I... warrant means you're under arrest. Uh, uh, and in case you're interested, Mr. Van Buren, the conclusive evidence against you was furnished by Miss Schleicher. Young lady, could you even be loyal to your own country? But this is my country. Obviously more than it's yours, Mr. Van Buren. Much more. Jonathan Van Buren was convicted in federal court for a violation of the federal registration statute and sentenced to a federal prison. In the years before World War II, your FBI was criticized by certain factions on the premise that nothing was being done to meet the Nazi fascist threat to our internal security. What was being done could not be publicized, but the record speaks for itself. During the war, there was not one successful enemy-directed act of sabotage. Your FBI cannot at this time make public its full record on what is being done to combat the communist menace in this country. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is, by presidential directive, charged with protecting you in matters concerning espionage, sabotage, and subversive activities. You may rest assured of one thing. Your FBI is doing that job. Doing it 24 hours a day. Now, just two things to remember about the Equitable's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. First, it shows you exactly what monthly income your family would require if the breadwinner should die unexpectedly. Second, this pictorial chart doesn't cost you one cent. Ask your Equitable Society representative for a free copy or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, armed robbery. Its title, crime for sale. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson. And Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Alice Backus, Herb Ellis, Eddie Firestone, Charles Maxwell, Victor Rodman, and Theodore Von Elf. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Crime for sale on... This is your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. There's fun for the whole family when Ozzie and Harriet come your way next. This program came to you from Hollywood.